We got the cure, we got the answer to what's happening in society. We got the power to solutions and provide the healing that you need. We got the cure, we got the answer with discussions that will set you free. This is the Ark Republic, and you're listening to The Remedy. The Remedy. The Remedy. Before the coronavirus pandemic, school systems across the U.S. from K-12 and at the college and university level were already struggling. From underfunding to under-resourced and understaffed, the issues were endless, creating a difficult environment for both staff and students. When COVID-19 forced schools to shut down, the problems that already existed amplified. Teachers were thrust into the responsibility of turning in-class interactive classrooms into virtual learning sites in a matter of weeks. For some, it was a matter of days. With the educational system turned upside down, all of those who were barely hanging on fell out of a system already failing students, parents, and teachers. Now in the new school year, school districts, colleges, and universities were faced with the question of reopening or remaining virtual. But the decision made by education leaders often clashed with its most important asset, the teachers. Today on The Remedy, we talk to educators to get their insight on sustainable, implementable, and worthy solutions in this new coronavirus, COVID-19 educational era. All right. How are you guys doing today? Okay. Good. Okay. First up on the panel, we have Mikhail Furness. Mikhail Furness is from Los Angeles. He is um, a former high school Spanish teacher. He has a master's in Latin American studies and a bachelor's for Morehouse in Spanish. What's up, Mikhail? Nothing much. How you doing, Kaya? I'm well, thank you so very much. Please, if you want to add something to uh, let the people know uh, more about you so it can contextualize this discussion, please do so. Yes. Uh... You know, I think the coronavirus kind of hit, affected me in different ways. Uh, you know, I have asthma. So being a Spanish teacher, um, the conditions that I was teaching in and even the conditions prior to COVID hitting were uh, challenging for me. And they illuminated some of the challenges that the school system faces with teachers who have uh, health conditions and pre-existing conditions and how even on even before before COVID how the challenges of working and being effective and staying healthy so you can be able to do your job. Uh, It it was a problem before then. So I think, you know, the COVID situation exacerbated it. And for me, it made me make a hard decision. Do I stay in this environment or do I look out for my health? Mm. And so I had to make a choice. Next up is Crystal Williams, born and raised in Inglewood. VI, as we say, (laughs) just graduated from USC, congratulations, with a master's in dispute resolution. She currently is a special education teacher to students with emotional disabilities. And if if I remember, Crystal Williams was in our light series, and she also created this program with yoga and mindful meditation. Yes, that's correct. Um, In addition to my master's in dispute resolution, I have um, my master's in uh, teacher education and both my mild, moderate, and moderate, severe teaching credentials. And I also have a master's degree in forensic psychology. So um, I kind of have taken the different things I've learned about trauma and how that impacts the students and um, kind of put all of that together um, in my teaching program in my classroom. So thanks for having me. Thank you and welcome to the show. And last but not least, we have Jennifer Wager. Jennifer Wager lives in Newark, not Newark, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, um, The media homie, we've been on many assignments together. Uh, She is a professor of new media technology at Essex County College, also known as ECC. She is also a filmmaker. Um, Sorry about that. I am the worst student right now. Please forgive me. All All teachers are the worst students. (laughs) Oh oh my gosh. After I finish my my studies, every class I take, I flunk. Proudly at this point, I'm exhausted. Yeah, I yeah, I actually uh, have uh, directed a number of documentary films on education, 
uh, in different uh, countries around the world, including Cuba, uh, and then also various education struggles to save public education. So that's been a focus of my documentary film work as well. Thank you and welcome to the show. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm slipping and, and some of us will be is we are already tired and it hasn't even been what well, it has, it's been about a month in school. People's eyes are crossed. We didn't really have a summer to rest and relax. It was all about pedagogical approaches to teaching online. So this is a timely conversation. This is less, we're less than 30 days out uh, to the presidential election. And I think that one of the voting blocks, the teachers need to be um, on the platform talking about what matters. So before we do that, I want you to, let's, let's kind of wheel it back and talk about the shutdown. What was it like for you and how did you make it through? Um, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, for me, um, I started watching the coverage about coronavirus really early and started paying attention really soon. And so I think the week before, for the entire week or so before the school got shut down, I started asking like, when are we gonna shut down? Because I don't think you guys understand the severity of what's happening right now. Like we need to shut down. If we don't shut down by Friday, I'm not coming back to work. If that means that I don't have a job, that's just what it means, I'm not coming. And then that following Friday, we shut down. So um, since then for me, um, it's been really busy just trying to figure out how am I gonna reach my, my students? A lot of them, when we left, we didn't send them home with any technology. You know, I guess we, I didn't realize how long we were gonna be gone. I, you know, I don't know if people thought, oh, it'll be a week or two or, or whatever, but my kids didn't go home with devices. So trying to still connect with them and teach them became very difficult. Um, I did end up teaching ESY for summer school and I had about half my kids, but still it was the same thing internet connections, not having a device, not having somebody home to help them navigate through my online platform. Um, it's all, it's, it was very stressful and I feel like I actually didn't get any time to rest because as soon as ESY was over, it's, oh, we need to start doing these new, um, new webinars and, and PDs that we can learn about all the things that's coming up. And then I was doing that on my own as well, just from different groups on Facebook, like let me figure out what is it going to look like? How am I going to put together an online classroom? So it's been pretty much nonstop for me. And we've actually been, I just wrapped up week eight. So I'm pretty deep in it right now. Oh, okay. And what's ESY just for? Um, ESY is, uh, is what they call summer school for students who have um, IEPs. It's called extended school years intended to help um, prevent them from losing the, the progress that they made over the year. What were the accommodations for um, special needs students who had severe, who were severely special needs? What was that like? I, wh what happened? So um, just as far as what I've heard from my different um, friends who do work with that population, I haven't worked in that population about five years now, but um, it's been very stressful. Um, having, I have a, a really good friend who teaches adult transition and you know, her students are, are very severe. And so trying to even have them log onto the computer without assistance, particularly if they have parents who are home, but also were computer illiterate, um, dealing with, you know, language difficulties and trying to help provide resources to parents. So there are a lot of issues, mainly just with the fact that the kids who are more severe, they're going to struggle much more with that screen time and trying to do the different activities, having to go from Google Classroom to the place in the classroom where the assignment is and then having to log on to Zoom for class and that's a different platform than Google. So a lot of that has been very difficult. She actually had to do quite a bit to really plan out and write out a task analysis of a step-by-step -step to how to do anything just to get, make sure that her moderate severe students had access. So I know for their population, it's very difficult. Yeah, so for me, um... I got out about a week before the school shut down because in my situation, I had a series of students who had been sick for since like October. And when you work in the classroom, you, you kind of become a germaphobe. You're conscious of the space you have because in many instances, you have a classroom full of 30 people. Uh, you may, in my instance, I taught in a trailer so the size was impacted. It was in a lot of space, um, not a lot of ventilation. 
So it's a pretty much a 10 box. So if you teach in those environments, you have to be really cognizant of your health and the wellness of other students. So even before the concept of COVID was out, I would have my, my students sanitize the desk. We have disinfectant wipes because there were often many kids who would come to school sick. And so for, it became a, 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 an awareness thing for me. And then we started, as we got closer to March, we started hearing things. But by that time I had made the commitment because a lot of things had happened my health I said okay I need to make this decision now uh, before any we leave it up to school district to make a decision that may be too late or I take the chance and because you're involved in the school you catch something you become ill and it impacts you in other capacities so I left before so what I still find from my colleagues is pretty much the same thing that Crystal echoes it's the electronic divide the technological divide a lot of our students have cell phones, but they may not have internet. A lot of our parents uh, may or may not have been active with the school system, understand how to use Google Classroom, how to allow or enable alerts so they can maintain effective communication between teacher and parents, and even having administration create those situations where we could use Google Classroom as a vital tool we could tap in and maintain communication with parents. So I think those challenges that we have resources that maybe we did not use effectively kind of makes this situation a little bit more critical. But, you know, every teacher's situation is different. For me, it was health. But as we move forward, as I continue to talk with people, it's more along the same lines, communication. How do we get kids connected? How do our parents get involved? How do they understand what's going on in the system? So, Kaya, another thing that um, that really was impact, you know, which really impacted me when everything shut down was um, I actually in my classroom, about half of my students at that time were in group homes. So for me, I, I was, was going to ask about the foster youth. That was that yes. was my I wrote that down because there's and a huge population in the L.A. County, San Bernardino. Absolutely. In the Riverside area, I didn't realize how how many children there were in foster care and um, I, you know, my first thought was, you know, I'm not going to, you know, this is another loss for my, for my babies. They're, you know, all of a sudden I'm snatched from them and we don't have any way to communicate. What kind of trauma is that going to lead to? They, you know, they finally, at that point, I have, I had fifth graders with emotional disabilities fighting and, and getting upset with each other every day, but they still were together. They still like to play together. So now they already didn't have a lot of friends because they're in this separate classroom, separate program. And now they're snatched from all of them as well. I had several kids from the group home be placed out of into foster care, um, you know, after that. And then it's like, well, now I don't know where they are. I hope they're, you know, they're going to somebody that's nice. Do they have everything they need? Did they leave anything in the classroom? So a lot of stuff that you can't really do anything about when you're a teacher, but was a very much a concern for me was was the mental health of my of my children because I do do yoga with them every day and like are they going to remember that they can go on YouTube and watch a meditation video if they get nervous like just hoping that the things that I've started trying to do with them would continue so that they would at least feel you know mentally like they were in an okay place but for a lot of my kids coming to school was their escape and I know a lot of them, it was hard for them to be at home and still be at home for, you know, it's been over six months now. So, you know, I just, that's the thing that really has, has gotten to me the most is wondering about how my children are doing. Kaya, can I piggyback on that? Yeah, this is a total conversation. This is a total so, conversation. So to piggyback on that in that, in that same lane, uh, one of the things that I noticed and was, you know, you deal with as teachers is the homeless, homelessness issue. You know, so homelessness, you know, does not necessarily mean you are without a place to live, but it may be compacted living, you know, where it may be two or three families in a two bedroom apartment. So it's those conditions, I think, you know, as we look at how we are dealing with COVID and how children are dealing with and families are dealing with it's the compacted families. It's the fact that maybe some of these students had to work and now, uh, the economic situation has changed. Whereas, you know, before COVID, the, the excuse, well, I had to go to work and I couldn't finish my homework. But now the question is, there is no work for anybody. 
and the living conditions are impacted. Uh, the parents can't work. So the strain on the social economic conditions for the communities has, has really gotten really tight, I think. And I think the homelessness, group homes, children from foster home, group homes, though that population is really being underserved and, and stretch, stretched out in this, in this time frame. And, and when you think about like optimal learning conditions, right, you want kids to be somewhere where it's engaging and they can be focused, but they can still communicate and, you know, feel free to make mistakes. But, you know, but now it's like I have several kids who they're, they're all trying to be in their distance learning in the same room within the family because that's where they have to be. So even the suggestions that I want to make, I had to realize we're coming from a place of privilege. I have another space in my house to go if it gets too loud. My students don't. So really just having to be very patient with them about that. If they say they can't hear me, if they say it's, they need me to repeat something, just remembering like there's a very, there is a very legitimate reason why they need these things. And I need to, to do that. I can't just expect that you listen to me the first time and you do it. Um, my, the internet connections, I, you know, some parents I've been able to say, hey, I just upped my internet speed. Are you able to up yours? And some of them can, but some of them, they can't. They're on the most basic level of internet because that's what they can afford. And just trying to find ways to help the kids still be active and participate when they have a really low, you know, slow signal is something that's also very difficult. But it's just one of the things that you have to try to do to adjust so that the kids can, you know, can stay with you as much as possible. Uh, just everything that you guys are saying about um, K through 12 students, I would um, reaffirm in terms of my students. Uh, I teach at community college, so uh, a lot of the same kinds of issues uh, uh, my students face um, from the adult level as as students, but then also as parents or you know caretakers uh, for students um, for K through 12 students. And during the shutdown in particular, um, it was pretty dire because I'm in the New Jersey, New York area, which was one of the first epicenters. And of course that, you know, uh, things were extremely chaotic in March. We were trying to uh, push um, uh, our, our school administration to shut down the school so that we could, you know, stop any kind of spread. Um, of course, they didn't want to do that. And um, uh, for obvious reasons, um, but and a lot of us got sick, I got sick, my students got sick. Uh, we couldn't go to hospitals because the hospitals if you went to the hospital, you know, it was it was more likely you're going to increase your viral load and get sicker. Uh, so it, you know, doctors weren't available. So, you know, on top of that, um, being um, uh, all of those issues and then trying to just survive, you know, with your healthcare uh, was very difficult. I had seven students who lost um, uh, parents or grandparents uh, that they were living with. So then they became care the primary breadwinner for their families. And, you know, they're 18 maybe or 19, um, as well as primary caretakers for, for their younger siblings or cousins and so forth. So, you know, just, and then trying to teach when you're, you're sick and you can't fucking breathe. <laughs> That's another uh, thing. So it, it, you know, it's, um, it was really difficult. And a lot of us have still, I feel like have PTSD that has not really been dealt with because we just had to keep running and keep working. And then students had to go back and get, got, usually lost their job, had to go out and the only ones who were hiring were, were like Amazon, where you know you were more likely to get sick again. It just came out that Amazon, twenty thousand workers, uh, got sick with COVID. So you know it was it was hell. We made it through, but now we're dealing with the aftermath of hell, um, and uh, things. There's we're looking around, and there's not really any help forthcoming. The only help that has come has been from each other through mutual aid networks and, and so forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to ask, did, 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 uh, did, because you, you said you got sick, you had COVID-19. 
Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh huh. I'm sorry about, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Cause yeah. I know, you know, uh, there was one woman who I talked to 20 uh, family members and friends died in two months. Um, and because she was a media person, she was the one who wrote all the obituaries. Um, and um, was there any hazard pay or any extra pay you were given? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm just trying to cover all bases. I mean, I'm just trying to cover all bases. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out Well, that's Who's good. Sister? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there yeah, was no, one, but fam one just, fam. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just to say that, um, uh, you know, and there's a lot of um, aftermath, you know, obviously there's, there's, that's not being talked about in terms of damage uh, to your internal organs. I definitely suffered that, but um but uh, like I said, it, it wiped out, like you said, it, it wiped out entire families. I had several students that it took multiple people and then now they're the breadwinners and they're 18 and they got like 10, 10 people in their family they're responsible for. So, you know, that's what we're facing. Um, and, and, and I mean, even, even, you know, you know, where I work, you know, there was an assumption that the, a lot of the students who come, you know, are coming from middle class you know, or at the, the worst, low middle class families. But a lot of these students, as we were finding out, because their parents were um, high risk, couldn't work, were then became the breadwinners. They were the essential workers that went out and earned the little bit of income that they could in order to make ends meet because their parents could not work anymore. So, I mean, there were students telling me that they were happy that they were getting like 30 cent raises from the, from the summer job that they, that they had. So this is, I mean, this rolls into, I think the, the next question um, is, is that what were some of the kind of main issues that were going on before the pandemic that just became crises level situations or emerged before? Because, you know, I would hear students talk about struggling and I was just thinking, you know, it's just the college struggle. But when the pandemic happened, no, it was some life or death, we eat today or we don't eat, you know, type of situations uh, that were going on. So what were some of the things that you experienced or know about or happened at your schools? I know you, we've already talked about some of them. One thing that I've noticed, I don't know if a lot of people are, have, you know, been thinking about it in this terms, but um, we already had a hard time getting substitute teachers. And um, trying to find a substitute in a pandemic is even harder. Um, I've, I'm at the point where I can't, I don't feel like I can take a day off because who's going to teach my class? And state law, I can't leave my aides to teach my class. Um, my other colleagues that I work with that, you know, wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise before, they definitely can't do it now because they're all teaching their online classes. And so, you know, I ha am, have been faced with, I, if I really need to be off, then I'm just going to have to cancel class for that day and then try to figure out where I can make that up. And that's a really sucky place to be when stuff happens for us too. Like I've had losses that I've, you know, suffered since we've left. And, you know, you, it really is a struggle to even deal with the things that you have to go through on your own because you can't take away from giving to the kids. It's like, it's, it's really hard for me. So it's, it's been a struggle with a lot of teachers I know um, having, you know, heightened anxiety about not being able to see their kids and make sure their kids are okay, not being able to take care of things that we need to take care of because we feel like we need to be online. Um, there's a, and as a special education teacher, there's already a lot of paperwork that's required. And this has probably double, triple what I'm required to document how I documented, where I documented. Um, and for a lot of teachers, I know that that is sending them into crisis mode, just having to deal with all the new requirements. And even just last, uh, on Friday, I had a meeting and my, I just led an IEP that, that afternoon. And then by the time we got to the meeting an hour and a half later, my principal was like, oh yeah, and if you had any IEPs from yesterday or today, you now need to do this form that they uploaded. And I was like, so like, <laughs> am I, 
so who's going to go back and help me fill out this form for the IEPs I did before? Like there was already something else I had to do in addition to my IEP. Like, so it's just so many different things that they're just adding on to what we have to do to prove that we're, we're teaching our students and it's really become very overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with Crystal uh, because like I said, when you take your health, it's not just your physical health, it's your mental health. And in addition to the non-ending amount of paperwork teachers have to fill out, a lot of my colleagues had part-time jobs and other family issues. So it's one thing to understand. I think what people don't understand, you know, although the teaching day may be 6.45 to 3 o'clock, teaching is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. You ne te a teacher never stops worrying about the, the students, even if you are on you know, at a stoplight or something or at a park, you may be Googling or looking up an app or something, figuring out a way that you're going to engage your students. So for teachers, you know, in addition to the paperwork and maybe even the connection you have with your students, it's the whole crisis of how do you take care of yourself? How do we stay sane and still able to pursue the passion? Because and even before the, uh, the shutdown, teaching can sap a lot out of a human being. And we have a lot of people who went to school for different passions because they either like English or arts or sciences. And that came smothered. And the ability of an adult or a professional to give that back was compromised before, but now it's even more so. And to Crystal's point, uh, the ability to find subs. So when I, when I was in the, before the shutdown, I was in Charlotte. And I was at a school where on average, now this is, now getting subs may be one thing depending on your socioeconomic condition, but this particular school in the inner city, on average, we had 15 to 20 subs at the school daily. Now you had subs teaching core subjects, English and math. In fact, when I came in, it was a battle because the students had, didn't had, had a sub Spanish teacher for like a year and a half. And now you're asking them to take Spanish two, Spanish three, in a quote unquote immersed environment in which you know they didn't have those uh, that opportunity before. So one hand you have overworked teachers, and on the other hand, you have an absence of. And so that creates a wholly dysfunctional environment that students are dealing with which in the middle are the students who at sometimes really don't give a fuck about none of this because I have a sub that's teaching me English or teaching me calculus or teaching me science and I really want to go to college. And you're on the other hand, a bunch of overworked teachers because of the insurmountable IEPs or forms you have to fill out. Or let's say you, you identify a student with some services, you have to fill out a form to set up an appointment to get the student to get some help. So there are so many other things that are going on with this. I think if we take the, the logistics, I mean, take the, the, the COVID out, the health scare out, the system had to do a better job of making sure that teachers are balanced, that they're uh, well adjusted, they're human, they can take care of their families. And we have to do a better job of filling in that talent pool because there are too many subs. And not to say that subs are a problem, but uh, real quick, it's and then finding subs that are able to use technology. That was a problem too in our school and at the school system I was at. So, and I mean, we're talking about decades of um, defunding of public education over the last uh, you know 40, uh, 40 years, decades of, of defunding every year cuts. Um, to teachers, to supplies, to facilities for any kind of student services. So, I mean, that's where we are right now in U.S. as a as a late stage capitalist country. That um, we've had 40 years of complete drain on public education. And I mean, given the fact that that education under a capitalist system is not necessarily meant to fulfill everyone's needs, it's meant to churn out workers, <laughs> but um, even still, there are, there are, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of teachers across the U.S. that, you know, still are very committed to giving um, 
the, the best education possible, even with, with under horrific uh, circumstances. So that has to be recognized too, that this is, there's been um, just an attack on public education, both in terms of funding of it, and then also an attack on uh, teachers unions and worker organizing in the education field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, and, and, and to oh, you, can I pick back on that too? Mm -hmm. Because you're asking teachers to do all these things. And so when I was leaving uh, the school district in Charlotte, the issue was a retroactive 3.5% pay raise when the cost of living has been constantly going up. And this pay raise was supposed to be six years ago, maybe. But you bring in superintendents and people who continue to make six figures, but they get recycled out every other year. You get high paying jobs at the top, but the teachers have to have to argue and beg for 3.5 percent raise. That doesn't keep up with the standard of live, cost of living while they are also putting out money from their pockets to supplement supplies in the classroom. But that's, so, you know, that, that's the consequence of the defunding. So, but that, but you actually raise a point I wrote down, like there's some serious pay gaps between what administrators get paid versus what teachers get paid versus what teachers aides or assistants get paid staff and certainly those who are in maintenance uh, or work in the cafeteria or the food systems. These gaps um, have ultimately, in my opinion, created a working poor. If you're not an administrator, you are a working poor. And even on the college level, I did not know one professor in my department who, in, who I had a conversation with about, you know, what they do did not have some type of side gig, a summer gig, a summer teaching job, or something, something, something to um, um, supplement a teacher's income because tuition and job responsibilities uh, you know, and all these other things pile up. So I'm glad you you you, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. uh, can I throw a tangent out there? Because you say that, and I think it's funny because I think we think our students are naive, okay? As we talk about the education system. And so I remember having a conversation with a young lady one time, with a young student uh, in my class. I took her cell phone. She was on the phone. Mm -hmm. And at the class, I was like, she was like, I need my phone. I need to make a call. I was like, you need to tell up the phone and do your work. Well, I wasn't talking on the phone. I was... Uh, trying to order some product. Like, what are you talking about? I have a business. Like, what? Little 11th grade girl. She showed me her website. And long story short, she divulged in her 10th grade year, she made $75,000. She made more than a teacher. A teacher with a PhD. I mean, a teacher with a, with a certified, with a math. You really got to be an admin to make 75, or at least in your 15th, 20th year to make that amount of money. But that's where our school system is missing. It's missing the opportunity to capture bright minds like that and, and, and students who, who can hustle. There are a lot of students. When I say hustle, I'm not meaning anything illegal. I mean, actually get out on your entrepreneurial spirit and create an avenue for yourself. So where students are creating, you know, t-shirt uh, businesses or, t you know, designing shoes or selling products, they look at educators differently while we're out there teaching, working Uber, maybe working at Amazon. And that pay gap affects how teachers come to school. Teachers, if you have to work until three in the morning, get right back up at six, you're not going to be, you know, well adjusted. You're going to be tired because there are the family issues where students are sitting in class like, I just got to get through this, but my bread is coming from other places. So that economic component is something that students see. They understand with teachers. They know teachers. We know y'all get paid once a month. They know all these things, and it's an interesting conversation when you have them with students, and they, and they see that. But I, I also want to say this also creates this dynamic that teachers are thought to be the hired help, right? Uh, and so that we operate in this capacity of being customer service. Uh, and so if, you know, the product that's delivered is not, you know, satisfactory. There's a certain core of, you know, students and parents on the privileged side that think that they can, you know, get you fired, right? So there's even a kind of, to me, a different relationship with education that has eroded 
uh, the respect and the value uh, of, of, of a teacher. I also want to bring up, and I, I have to emphasize this point, the, you talked about, we talked about the mental health, but I don't think we emphasize the physical well-being of a lot of teachers, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of people, were having a lot of issues, a lot of, you know, issues prior to that exacerbated or were not properly taken care of you know, in it, um, you know, somebody I know that has like issues with high blood pressure and diabetes was, you know, literally from 8 a.m. to midnight, Monday through Friday, was, it was teaching and then prepping for teaching the next day because they had been teaching for 30 plus years and had never taught virtually and was just having a difficult time and really wanted to service their children, uh, but suffered you know, and, 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 you know, almost put themselves in the hospital because they were not walking, they were not drinking water properly, they weren't doing all these things just so they, you know, spending all this extra time after class with the, with the parents, which leads to another thing. It also exacerbated, or in my opinion, the issue that a lot of parents, as a result of the 30, 40 years of uh, defunding the, the school system that Jennifer talked about, a lot of parents were struggling to help their their you know, children in terms of navigating, navigating the educational project process because they were more um, involved. So you know, those are the things that I saw. Kaya, you know what, and it's, you know, I think when it comes to parents, I think, you know, one of the crisis is college education. And, you know, as a teacher, you see parents operate from a standpoint of fear. How, how are we going to pay for this education? And the only thing you have right now are your transcripts. And so I think the interaction between teachers and parents are, is, is caustic because of the financial impact of, of, of grades. You know, there was a time you could probably go to college with a 2.5 and a 750 on the SAT. That's not really happening anymore. And college tuition is going up. So there's a challenge well, in terms Really? You could do that. You can, you can go to community college. Right, but that's okay. Now we're talking amongst ourselves, but there's a perception from other parents who have that community college is not good enough. I need, oh, okay. I need, a, I, I need a higher prestige. So I think how we look at school is different than how parents who may be uh, of a certain class, certain background, in which grades equate status, which equates scholarship, which equates interest. So. I think having to understand different avenues to your point how, you know, a community college is good, uh, a four-year institution is good, and HBCU is good, but it's having those conversations effectively between parents and teachers and administrators in a way that helps them understand, okay, this is our goal, but I think at the end of the day, parents are really operating off of fear because of how much college costs nowadays, and will they be able to get in, and will they be able to afford it, and my grades and the success is based off, or tuition and scholarship is based off of my academic success. So the, so the educational system has changed as a result of the pandemic, like everything pretty much across the board. What is your assessment of it now? What does it look like now to you? If, if somebody said, could you give me an analysis or a temperature? So, um, <laughs> Earlier this summer, I, I, when uh, we had our first uh, Teacher Week professional development series, um, I realized that the current state of our education system is far worse than anything I had ever maybe thought was going on. Um, I feel like a lot of people in authority in K-12 education in particular thought that by the time the fall comes, we're gonna be going back to school, so it'll be okay. And there were no real plans. Um, there were no real resources. There were no real suggestions for how we really take this and make this doable and workable. There was no, there's no consistency behind the structure of different classrooms or the minimum expectation. And I think all of that has just kind of exploded since the pandemic. Like I, I was really floored when I went to first week PD and realized that 
nothing they could teach me was going to do me any good because I had already went through on my own time during the summer and looked up all those resources. So I had that already. So it's like, well, what did I come here for? Right. And I know a lot of teachers went through that, went to that week thinking this is where I'm going to get all the stuff that I'm going to need to be ready. And none of that was the case. And, you know, I think that uh, it really just opened and put a spotlight on how much teachers aren't considered, how much things are not communicated with us. There were surveys going out to parents for months before anybody sent us a survey to a teacher asking us what we wanted to do. How were we feeling about coming back to school? And, you know, it, it seems like the, the people who have to go in and do the work are not the people that are being considered when it is time to make policy recommendations or changes. And a lot of people who are in those administrative credentials are very far removed from the classroom. And so they have kind of lost sight of what it's like to be in that classroom every day. And when people start talking about, yeah, we're, we're gonna try to do everything we can to get back to classes right away. And I'm thinking, shoot, my classroom only has eight and I know it's not big enough to six feet distance between all of us. So a general education teacher in a smaller, in a classroom with 30, how are that, where is, is there gonna be a PPE budget in addition to supplies budgets? Like, what does that look like? And none of that has been really laid out or, or, or explained in a way that has been able to make me feel like, okay, the system is ready. So whenever they open up, I'm ready to go back. I am still very much so of the mindset. There's going to be a lot of watching from a distance that I need to do before I ever step foot back into a classroom. So mm -hmm. it, it just really opened up that a lot of things that people assumed were natural, you know, people are planning for this. Like I live in an area where and, you know, before the pandemic, fire evacuations are, were the main concern. I live, you know, I, I work in Beaumont. Uh, they had a huge fire there out near Coachella. And my thought was, if this is something that happens every year and kids are possibly going to have to be evacuated, there should have already been some sort of plan in place for if we have to go out, away from school. We live in California, or I live in California earthquake country. We've been expecting a big one for the last 20 years. Has there not been a plan? You know, what if that happens? We don't have a plan in place for that. How are kids going to learn if, we, if that happens? So if they weren't even thinking of the stuff that is a, is a severe concern year after year and have a plan for that, them having a plan for something that popped up out of nowhere, it <laughs> really exposed how horrible the system was, was, was being managed. Right. And, you know, I, I, I concur because I think it underscores like, like how disingenuous all the promulgations have been, you know, um, uh, district after district says that, you know, we're preparing students for 21st century education and they roll out these shiny iPads and get a photo, a photo prop and they roll out one to one computers. They put it on the website. They put it on the local news but they still miss the point. Because if you know you wanna prepare students or families for the 21st century and you're about equity, okay, let's talk with these companies and say, maybe we can get the whole neighborhood wired with internet. That'll make sure that you know there's internet and just, not just a cell phone that you could tether something to. Big difference. You know, at some stages, you know, I'm, Re redefine how you use your resources. What about mobile hotspots? Giving out mobile hotspots because you're already getting the one-on-one computers, but if they, there's no internet connection there, what good is that computer? Because you have, and I, and I had some students who would go to a Starbucks or go to Panera to do their homework because that's where, the computer, that's where they had a computer. I mean, an internet connection. And if you got off work at maybe nine o'clock, and then you're trying to get to Panera by 10 o'clock to do your work, that's, that's a tight schedule. So it's finding ways to be efficient, and I just say equity. And I think a lot of school districts put out these terms because it, it's, a, it's lotion, it feels good. You know, oh, we want to say something to the people because this is what they want to hear. But uh, the, the, the business of doing the work with the, bis with, with the uh, corporate community, as they have those relationships. How do you read, uh, redesign your internal communication systems to make sure that there's an internal uh, web communication system between the teachers that they can communicate? Uh, we have all these advances with technology 
and we still have a hard time in making it easier for kids to do work and easier for teachers to do work. So I think right now it's about the district should have done, you know, it proved that the district has not done what they said and the strategies for making sure that students are at least ready. The basic is to make sure the neighborhoods are wired, hot spots. That could solve half the problems right there. You know what? Um, so that made me think of something else. Um, I've been asking a lot about the training that's being provided to parents because if parents are at home and they're expected to be supporting their kids with the distance learning, you know, if they don't know how to utilize these programs and they aren't going to be of help either, it is already hard enough for parents to help kids with common core standard homework because that's not how we learned it, right? That's the mm -hmm. biggest thing that I'm getting. The kids going to go back to school and they're going to be telling the teachers, well, my mama didn't do it like that. <laughs> and that's a legitimate concern because ever since, ever since the switch to Common Core, I've been saying like, who, where is the training for parents so that parents understand this is why it has changed this way. This is why we think it's going to be better for them. This is why we think this is going to eventually help with their critical thinking. We want you to know that this is the same thing that you learn, but in a different way. And this is how you can see it. Parents still don't have that basic understanding. So now kids are having homework that they have to do at, at home online and the parents have no idea how to help them. The, uh, what the parents feel like they need to do is let me just do it for you if I can, because it's stressing you out. And now it's stressing me out because I don't know what's going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just really shows like parents are not, what parents need to be able to support children is also not being prioritized enough. And that was before this happened, but even more so now you can see the real need that we have to really encourage parents to be a part of the educational community because I think that's a lot of the reason why a lot so many parents like you alluded to earlier Kia was you know parents um, thinking that we're just like a, a dumping ground or a babysitter or you know that, that that's kind of what we're here for is just to kind of supervise your children when you have to work they don't really they didn't really even though we've all gone through school right we know that that's not what happens somehow people have come to the conclusion that all of a sudden now school is just the babysitting space and that's that's not the case right yeah. so parents have to yeah. be involved in more communications with administration teachers so that they can understand what we're trying to do why we're trying to do it that way let us help you figure out how you need to be able to support and participate as well so that now kids are at home with their parents and they don't have anybody that they can ask for additional support when they log off the of class. But to say um, the pandemic's just like taking the exist pre-existing uh, racist, sexist uh, classes in inequality is not really strong enough of a word to describe it, but it's a huge, um, disparity and it's it's just taking it and put it on steroids i mean so everything that um was racist and sexist before is like just off the hook off the chain steroids uh uh in terms of its impact and effect and so you know you saw that with the with the um disproportionate number of, of black latino and native uh, deaths in terms of or people who died from covid and you see that now in terms, especially in public education, in terms of, you know, whose kids um, are struggling to get Wi-Fi, who have to go to McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts to get Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, again, I teach community college, so I, you know, my students are, this, are the parents, you know, or older siblings um, of, you know, the K through 12 students who are facing that. So they're calling in, you know, we have Zoom classes, they're calling in, on their phones. So basically, you know, a lot of my classes, I, I run like a podcast now because, you know, students, uh, that's the only way they can access it because their, their kids or their, their children or their younger uh, brothers and sisters are the priority, you know, which is, is right uh, for the Wi-Fi that they have um, or the computer, the one computer that they have to share uh, amongst, you know, like three or four kids. So, um, so you know, it's, it's just, and then not to mention the fact that this is all falling on women. I mean, the pandemic has all fallen on women. It's been in terms, uh, not to, 
yeah, it's just, it's, you know, in terms of like setting back uh, women uh, decades, if not over a hundred years, because a lot of the caretaking is, um, was already on their shoulders, our shoulders, but now it's like, it's all, it's all, <laughs> you know, you're, you're working and then you're taking care of, of um, both younger people, uh, children, and then older parents um, or older um, people in your household. And then, um, you know, trying to, to navigate this also, maybe trying to go back to school. So it's just taken everything and exposed all the nasty, ugly, fucked up contradictions of capitalism. I think being in the middle of this, you have to also hold parents accountable because prior to COVID, we had curriculum nights and back to school nights. And those are opportunities where parents can come in and uh, find out about the curriculum and meet the instructors and get an idea of what's expected, okay? Now, I do temper that by saying that, understanding that parents have to work. There are some parents who work non-traditional hours. So that may not always be uh, effective, but I think, you know, when it deals to parents and parental involvement, and like Crystal alludes to having parents be involved with the educational process, uh, at this time while raising children, whether you're a single mom, whether you're a single father, whether you have been laid off, whether there are domestic issues. I think the family issues are things that need to be dealt with as well because these things impact the children, right? So what goes on at home is what they're gonna bring to school. So mental health is something that is important because if there aren't counselors and grief counselors that help children deal with what's going on at home in their communities, they're just gonna bring it, they're just recycling. They're recycling the trauma and the, site and the trauma never gets pushed out. So I think the family dynamics, whether it's work, whether it is parents being able to uh, participate for whether it's uh, professional reasons or health reasons or relationship reasons, all these things need to get fleshed out and, 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 and get a better a trajectory because these impact how students come to school, parents' ability to help and be uh, well mentally in order to see what their children needs to get done. I have to disagree with you on that, Mikhail. I think mm -hmm. putting the onus and say, I, I think that that's an excuse for a lot of conservative right wing and greedy, a whole bunch of greedy parasites who've been sucking the resources out of the educational system, not mm -hmm. holding them accountable. First, first of all, everybody don't have a parent, as Crystal mm -hmm. indicated. Right. And even if you do have a parent, people don't have the resources and the access. So even the most well-meaning parents, and even well, and I mean well-meaning parents, like even if they don't know the subject matter, but they want to get to somebody who does know the subject matter, how do you do that in a pandemic where you can't go outside and you really can't go here or you have a compromised immune system and all these factors. The pandemic, in my opinion, <clears throat> really um, showed or illuminated the wealth gap that exists. And the reason, when I just, it's not just money, but the resources gap of where, you know, there were families who were able to travel and go to their second or third homes, have great resources and also hire tutors you know, to right. help their children. And often these tutors were more so than likely doing the work of the children. I think a lot of the, the, the you know, is, is that, you know, uh, like, like uh, even a, like a student who is from some level of means, the assumption is, is that because they have means, they're able to be in a quiet time and do their work. No, those are the ones who turn up and don't do the work, in my opinion, the most but they have so many buffers, you know, any protections in place that they don't, they won't get sent to jail for not doing their homework. Like the, the, the young lady in Michigan, you know, who was, right. who was in foster care or on pro pro probation um, or, or parole. I taught at a high school 
in, in Los Angeles where 50% of the population was either in foster care or on probation. When you have, and it's like when you get arrested as an adult, once you have this number attached to you, you become connected to the state. Uh, and for me, <clears throat> so, so, say, so saying that, I'm not saying that, that, that parents mm, have to have a level of accountability I mean, because it is their children. I'm not, I'm not discounting that. But I think that when we look at the whole, it's just the systemic issues that have been in place. It gave parents who were struggling, just barely trying to make ends meet and then just assure their children go, it has the ability to go to school. It even placed even more pressures on them when you are in the midst of a government that says, well, we don't want you to have these reproductive rights. We want you to have the children, but we will strip everything and every type of resource that helps you care for them in some type of quality living. I think another thing um, is, uh, for me, <clears throat> what, what the assessment of a post-pandemic education system is, that song, I Believe the Children of the Future, has changed. Yes, the children are the future. They are the best come up. So many industries have made money off of educational systems, except the students and the teachers. When I was the, like I said, when I was a high school teacher in the early 2000s mm -hmm. um, um, uh, in Los Angeles, charter schools were just starting to, it was the green dot. I think it was I called the green there. dot. I used to work there. Yeah, right? and Animo, yeah, ISEF. I, was, I worked for all of them, actually. You worked, okay, yeah. I worked for, I worked for ISEF too. Oh, I got stories about ISEF. Straight up the devil, okay? <laughs> so, um, um, so the green, the green dot movement uh, started. And, mm. you know, shortly within this, I said, oh, this is all a money making scheme. Right. And it has elevated a money making scheme in terms of like education. I, somebody sat back and said, what industry can we make a huge amounts of money? And it appear like we're doing philanthropic or social good. Somebody oh, yeah. whispered it to somebody and said education. And that's yeah. why the children are the future, because they're still banking right. on education and stealing all the money and the resources and creating not workers, but robots or battery packs. The beauty of it is, is that a lot of these younger folk are, you know, beginning to have this resistance language, uh, you know, like, OK, well, if you don't, if you, you don't give a fuck about me, guess what? I don't give a fuck about this system. You know, excuse my language. So this is a very interesting time. Right. So that's what I would say is, is that even though these things are bottom, bottoming out, there's also this resistance that I see growing out mm. of these younger folks are like, nah, you ain't going to do this to me, player. I'm going right. to do everything in my power. Wait, in order to if, if I may. Yes, sir. If I may. So with, with my comment, what I, what I was uh, attempting to articulate was, bef and this is before the pandemic, and this can maybe address some of the, those issues that if we had better parent participation, mm -hmm. And parents really understood what was going on and where the dollars were going and vital parent input on resources, some of these situations may change. It, there may be better understanding of which way the curriculum is going. There may be a better uh, way to understand, okay, why are you taking teachers out of the classroom and creating curriculum leaders, but we still missing teachers? So understanding that creating, you know, how the district uses its money understand how, what is being taught and the expectations prior to the pandemic would have helped parents be better prepared going into this, I think, to be able to help their children um, be successful, understand what's expected to them, say that, you know what, hey, we don't have internet. And if two or three parents go to a board me a meeting and say, we don't have internet, then maybe that becomes this, the, 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 the charge to solve. Maybe we need to get internet for the community instead of just giving computers, because why give them a computer if there's no internet connection? For so parent participation For would be able to get, give them information so that they can make better decisions with the money. Now on top but of that, I think- Right, but I'm telling you for real, it was for surveillance. To okay. collect data on the habits of these, uh, not only students, but also these homes in order to submit it to these big data mining companies in order to profile these folk. It is a, that, that was years ago when Kobe Bryant funded some uh, nonprofit 
and mm. discovered that the laptops were literally spying on the students. You know, so this is not about I'm empowering people digitally. It mm. is to maintain the digital blueprint of these, you know, especially these folk coming up who are 100% embedded in the digital, you know, lifestyle. Yeah. That's what well, I mean, there's that's another what component I'm too. There's another component too, because it's also the policing, more parental involvement, because even prior to the COVID, uh, there's a rise in police presence on campus. Instead of security, they're having police come and arrest kids because fighting now is a felony in some states. So you got the incarceration, you know, school to incarceration pipeline connection there. But I think those things coming out of that, coming out of all those experiences are realities that are coming into COVID. But if the preparation and involvement was different, was more, you know, um, fervent, then I think maybe some changes could have been made. Now going into this, knowing that we have these conditions with policing, um, lack of resources, the digital divide, how do we really access this and how do we make sure we address this in a different way? Because a lot of the people who are principals and superintendents, they really don't know. And to your point, once you get an administration, that's a money grab. You know, that's where you can sit back and relax and go on your way out and do some speaking and maybe do a couple seminars, but it, it's not changing the face of education and it's not being effective in how we're changing the community and impacting students. I, I don't think our students look at, you know, when I was in school, I kind of liked going to school. I enjoyed my principal. He was strict. My teach, my principal, my teachers gave us direction. They gave us opportunity and space to learn. We went into community and learned. But this, what we're doing now, there's a total disconnect and everybody's at each other. And, and so the, the other thing I wanted to um, chime in on that, because I think that in addition to just like the, the focus on using the, the laptops and, you know, using it for, for means that aren't necessarily in the best interest of the children, right? Like it's a, like you said, it's a, a money grab. People are trying to put their ideas, technology out so that the schools can pay for it. And they don't really care if it's of interest, uh, you know, if kids can actually utilize it or not. Um, I think that, that is really evident in the fact that the, the issues, the only thing that I've been hearing is how do we get kids mm -hmm. the devices, right? But it's not so much like, how do we get kids? I feel like if, if we were really thinking in the best interest of kids, there would be more prioritization on how can we get the school nurses, the counselors involved to, if, if a child is not logging on, right? Where is the mental health person from the campus that can then call and say, hey, we notice that this child hasn't been on. Do you guys need something? Not he has to get on by this time or there's gonna be a consequence, but what, what do you need as a family that would, uh, that would assist you in, in getting the child here so that we can still try to teach them even though we're away? And there's not enough concern. The concern is only how do we make sure that the kids are able to pass the test when we get back to school because we're gonna pick up testing, right? How do we make sure that people are online so it looks like our district is having a high number of people who are participating than these other districts, right? But nobody is looking at what are the, the other supports that are gonna be necessary to make sure that even those kids who do have means, they do have, a, my nephew has a quiet space to go and to work. My sister is able to work from home and help him, but he misses his friends though. Like where is the support for Who's setting up groups for kids who need, who want to have recess together or, and don't go to the same schools or how are we coordinating to make sure that the kids still get to have that interaction with each other? Because those are the things that help them grow, develop, you know, develop social cues and, and norms. And they don't, they're missing that right now. And nobody <laughs> seems to really be focused on getting to getting anything to them aside from the technology that they assume is going to make kids do the work and, and make us look like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing because the kids are right. learning, right? So I think that, that it, even when you try to take it out of like, oh, let's not look at it from mental health, it still kind of is the same thing. Like mentally, if I'm feeling low, physically, I'm not gonna be doing well and I'm not gonna have the energy to get up and go to that class and log on. I'm not going to 
want to do the things that I might have been prepared to do otherwise because Man. I'm suffering mentally. I don't even realize that not seeing my friends every day is affecting me. I can't ask for help because I don't know that that's bothering me because right. I'm 10, right? So like, I think that it has to, we have to look at all of it. Like the parents too, I just, I think that they, a lot, I've, I've heard a lot of parents, you know, ready to send their kids back because it's hard and I'm tired, right? But like your kid may want to go back also, but your kid is probably scared to go back because they realize they've been out of school all this time for a reason. So like, I feel like every a lot of there's a lot of discussion always on the financial and the technological things that could make this better, but people aren't really focusing. People think that kids are just little tiny, you know, whatever, and they'll just soak up whatever we want them. They are living, breathing, right. feeling beings, and nobody is checking in with them about how this is impacting them. They're just kind of yeah, right taking whatever is coming to them because that's what they have to do. But nobody's asking them, how are you feeling about not being able to go see your friends every day? How do you feel right. about not being able to hug your teacher? Hello. Or, you know, see your favorite bus driver on the, but like nobody is checking in with kids on stuff like that. And I think that that's kind of what sucks kids out. Like I used to have kids that would barely come to school because they didn't like school, but they have to come. Right. Because the bus is going to be there. They're going to get their parents are going to make sure they get on the bus and they're come to school. And they didn't want to do much when they were at school, but when they're at home, now they don't want to do anything. There's no friends in that, in that space that say, hey, man, come on, like, we're going to go to recess later. Let's just get this done. And that is having a, a real impact on the kids, too. Like, they need that, as much as they need the access to the devices and thing, they still need that social interaction that right. they probably aren't even being allowed in a Zoom forum, They're, they probably are, like how Jennifer said, I have to go podcast out, right? There's not a lot of back and forth interaction, you know, it, and so it's, it's creating a, a different type of, of learning, a different type of education that, you know, we know that kids have to talk and they have to communicate, they have to move in order to really grab key concepts. And a lot of that is not happening. I, you know, even with myself, like I try to make my kids move around as much as possible, but they don't have the space in their homes necessarily to be able to get up and do those stretches or get the wiggles out or all the stuff we do in the classroom to help them self-regulate. They don't physically have the space to be able to do those different things. So it's, it's a lot of different parts that are coming into play that are not even being considered when it comes to what's happening with the children. Everybody's kind of looking at it from the perspective of the parents and the teachers, but not really what's happening with the children. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. this is a good segue for us to hyper-focus on solutions and things in this conversation that got us to thinking about, um, you know, what we can be, you know, bringing and offering uh, in order to deal with this new, this, this new way um, of life. Um, and actually, I, <laughs> it was so interesting. Crystal said, you know, nobody's thinking about the... <clears throat> the students, you know, they're thinking about the parents or the educators. I would say nobody really thinks about the educators. Um, uh, so I want, and, and, and I know this because I'm an educator. We always put everybody first uh, before we put our own. So in these solutions, I'm really interested to hear what are some things that you would like to see for educators as well in terms of you know, how we need to, to move forward because I think teachers are the, we are the problem solvers. You know, you could walk into a room, I, my mother, like my mother was a teacher, walk into a room and she go to a store for 15 minutes. The next day her whole room is lit up, stuff everywhere, bing, 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 you know what I'm saying? She taking duct tape and, you know, all this other stuff and her, you know, her, you know, very creative, right? So let's talk about these solutions. I like what Mikhail said, we need mobile hotspots. And this is another thing, Teachers also were having connectivity issues. I was, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so that was an excellent idea. Mobile hotspots. Crystal, you said an excellent idea, having mental health professionals and nurses, but not even for just the students. I think there needs to be a cadre for also the, the teachers and administrators as well. You know, so these are good solutions. So let's throw some of these more out. Uh, I have a couple, but I would love to hear what you have to say. You all have to say. For me, the, the, I have been telling my parents forever since I've worked in special education, the power is the parents. 
the parents have to say, like, I, and I think Mikhail kind of alluded to this, they have to get together and say collectively, like, we are not getting what we need and we know that there are ways to get it because X and Y district has it. Why don't we have it? And to really start pushing back because I think that, you know, a, parents need to really just be educated about a lot of the issues that are happening so that they are aware and they can say, hey, my teacher is, is having to deal with this. That's not okay. What are you guys going to do as an administration, as, a, as the district, as the superintendent? Who, what, who is committed to making sure that teachers have what they need? And I feel like the, the schools and, and admin are used to the parents saying, I mean, the teachers saying, we need more, right? But I think that once parents start to say, hey, we really can tell that there are more resources needed for our rooms and we can see that our schools, our classrooms are not getting access to that and kind of using their voice to really advocate for us as well because when it's, when it's just the teacher union, right, then it's the troublemakers, right? But once that teacher union has parents with them that support them and they can, can stand as a united front, that helps to bring change more so than if the teachers are doing it themselves. So I really think that, that the educators need to lean on the parents right now to kind of let them know, you know, the struggles that we're having so that they can advocate also on our behalf. I would say, um, I mean, I, I've been a community organizer in addition to an educator for several decades now and, um, or a few decades now. And uh, uh, so I always think the solution is, is organizing and more organizing. I think for educators, we need, um, uh, rank and file educators, we need to organize ourselves. Um, the unions, you know, have shown, I'm a member of NEA, which is one of the largest uh, educator unions, if not the largest in the U.S. And, you know, national is very reluctant, has been very reluctant to really, um, uh, in the past, to, to, to organize um, more, um, I would say, more militant action from uh, educators and so rank and file educators. It's been rank and file educators who have had to fight for our lives, literally. Like when they were, when they didn't want to shut down the schools in NYC and dozens of uh, teachers died and, and students and their families died, it was educators that were able to force de Blasio to, to close the schools. And you see that in Oklahoma, you see that in Tennessee, it's not just in in New York that's been educators organizing rank and file to make sure that that safe uh, schools are safe to go back to. Um, so I think it's got to be more organizing on the part of um, uh, educators. Uh, but like uh, Crystal said, it needs to be in conjunction with the communities that we are in. Um, so parents, um, uh, uh, community leaders and, and organizations. And, and we've seen that. I mean, here in, in Newark, you know, we've um, worked with uh, mutual aid organizations and, and community organizations to get aid to students and, and, and our families to help out other educators. So I think we need more organizing. Um, uh, we need, and, and, you know, student organizing, teacher organizing, parent organizing, community organizing. I think that's the only way that we will get what we deserve is by um, speaking up, speaking out, and coming together. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to add, I'm going to add some. I think there needs to be a total gut of union leadership, an absolute total gut of it. Um, uh, I think that more educators need to run for office and perhaps even consider creating a political pact between educators and parents. If you had a political pact, like in Newark, if three high schools consisting of educators and parents or even LA in the LA area came together and created a voting block, three high schools that had like feeder elementary and middle schools, three, and the parents and the educators came together, they would put people in office. You know, so ed I think educators need to run for more, uh, uh, run more for, 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 for office um, and, and supporting activist parents because there are some really great activist parents that we have, you know, the ones that are always at the school volunteering and things like that. I think we need to raise their, their vibration and their activism. There needs to be more political. I think there needs to be kind of like a whole political 
um, you know, well, I think that in general, I think we need to offer online classes to parents um, in order to uh, reduce this gap that we, we're talking about. So parents can learn along with, this, with, with their children in different ways. And part of that should be political education. I think that we would actually have, if we, <clears throat> if we could have like a political class for parents and they could talk, I think it would blow up the spot totally. And across the country, and everybody's learning about everybody's issues, and it centers in education, um, and, it, and about protecting the future, which are the, our, our children. I think that would be dope. Um, I also think that this is a really great time because millennials um, and those in Generation Z who are like at the end of you know graduating high school or college are um, in the midst of um, uh, like you know security for jobs. Um, there is this uh, thing I've been using called Fiverr, <laughs> which you can go. Fiverr is a, basically it's a gig thing where you can get inexpensive uh, videos, explainer videos and all these different things. I think this is an excellent, you know, the Department of Education can set up something for these millennials who are looking for jobs and pair them with educators K through 12 in college to make all the digital and the tech stuff that we can't do or we just don't have time to do um, and you know work out whatever that payment is. I think that will be important. Somebody said this on Facebook um, is, is that every uh, municipality or like county, something like that, or however the local TV station works needs to have several stations dedicated to teaching um, to supplement the online, or if somebody doesn't have online, they could just go to cable, to the local cable station. That could also translate to the, to the local TV, um, I'm sorry, radio station as well, um, if you don't have that. Um, uh, ombudsman, which we were talking about, if there was like some kind of agency. Oh, you are? No, that, so that's, that's, okay. <laughs> that's so funny that you mentioned that, because I, okay. um, my master's in dispute resolution is for mediation training, ombuds training. And I read an article from Yale um, years ago that talked about the need for third party mediation or mediators on school campuses that can not only answer the parents' questions, but it can also answer teacher, staff, administration questions and just make sure that everyone knows what the law says so that they know the boundaries that they're working within. And I definitely think that an ombuds in the education world, especially K-12 is something that's severely needed. Um, and there, I'm, I was try in trying to find the avenue for how to do that. Like that's, that's kind of the hard part for me is how do you create that in a field where people want to keep what they're doing under wraps because they, wanna, they don't want to get in trouble or they don't want to get somebody else in trouble but you know there, there, there's a need for somebody to be able to come in and see everything that's happening from a neutral perspective and say, okay, these are the things that need to change. These are the things that were brought to us. I looked into them, these things exist. What is our plan moving forward to make sure that these things are no longer in occurrence so that people feel comfortable with, with where they're sending their child to school. Teachers feel comfortable in where they're going to teach every day. Administrators feel like, I'm actively trying to resolve issues and working with all the different stakeholders involved. And right now it's so much of a us against them that people don't see, enough people don't see the benefit for having that third party neutral that can say, you know, something is happening and we need to, to look at the patterns and figure out why it's happening and how do we tweak that? How do we fix that? And there's, there's not enough of that. So, you know, in, in my, um, in my future life, I hope to be doing something like that. But just to even go back to your point about administrators and how administrators are kind of, you know, not on, on page anymore because they've been out for so long. I think for a long time, that was why I refused to even go into administration because I was like, I don't want to be that teacher that loses it because I became admin. But after watching the way that COVID and preparation got fumbled over the summer, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and apply for an admin program because maybe it is teachers like us or like me that need to get into administration instead of saying, I don't ever want to be one of them. So I'm going to say my social justice warrior in my classroom. 
We need those social justice warriors in our administration. We need those social justice warriors making that policy. We need them running, you know, in, in legislature. We need them everywhere because the way that we're able to kind of put things together is, is different from a lot of people, but you have to, we need that social justice focus on it. And, I've, and when I did my special education program, I did it at Claremont Graduate University, which is, they consider themselves a social justice teachers, teacher preparing, preparation program. And when I was done, everywhere that I went, anywhere that I worked, they were like, well, where did you get your degree? How do you know that? That was something that was embedded in our program. I took a special education law class as a part of my program. A lot of special education teachers don't have to. And even in my program, it was optional. So I was like, well, these are things that every special education teacher should know. Why is this optional and why is it only here? Why am I one of 50 people that's taking this class? Because nobody else thinks that this is an issue. General education teachers should have been in that special education law class so that they know what's gonna be required of them and how, the, how it can actually play out, how it can shut your school down if you're not following SPED law. So I think that these, the, the biggest issue is that teacher preparation programs are not preparing us all for reality of what is happening in classrooms. One thing that was constantly stressed to me was teaching is not gonna be rainbows and butterflies. It's going to be hard. There are issues that are happening. There are things happening with your, with your students that are going to be doing, things are going to be done wrong because it's more convenient that way. You have to fight that. And there aren't enough teachers getting that message in their teacher ed programs. And when they get into schools, they feel like they just kind of have to sit back and let everything happen and only focus on what's happening in their classroom instead of how do I take what I know is right for children and press that every inch of the way so that I make sure that my kids get what they need. And that has made me very unpopular in a lot of schools. I have had to leave some of those charter districts that you mentioned because of things like that. But I think that it's important that teachers who are social justice, that more programs need to be social justice focused so that social justice educators can then move into schools, become that administration and really begin to dismantle the system in that way. Because we know what the, this, the system has been we know what it could be if we actually had a social justice focus. And that is what needs to be the push in education. And right now, I just don't think there's enough educators that have that background or that training or that feeling in them because of the education that they received. That's just my, you know, my thought on it. And I, I mean, when, and I think when you look at all of this, if you're asking this system to do all of that, I think we're naive. And I think because the school system is becoming less political, it wants to be apolitical. They want to avoid conflict and, and litigation from parents. So what has to happen is, you know, communities have to create their own educational system. But I don't know that this system that we have is going to be willing to accommodate that mind state, that mind state of having a quote unquote political teacher organization because there are some schools that don't want you to be political in your conversation. There, there are some schools that don't want you to address, you know, oh, why was there some, uh, you know, as, as I was asked in Kansas, what are black people at, Mr. Furnace? Well, the black people were enslaved at this time. This is what's happening. Uh, Mr. Furnace, don't talk about slavery with them. That was some bad stories. Well, what are you talking about? It's history. So schools don't want you to address the truth in some instances. Schools will allow you to address the truth, but the only way you can do that and be effective and effective is having your own particular niche. Because other than that, it may pose for some frustrations. The question is, how do we maneuver until you get your own? How do we maneuver within it to move the needle to a more advantageous position? Because there's going to be a lot of things that school districts don't want to do because of a legal perspective, legal standpoint. But what can we do with up and coming teachers? I know that we talked about this with solutions, but I saw in the chat, uh, Jennifer mentioned the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we're gonna deviate a little bit, come back onto the, <laughs> onto the track. But we do have two problems. One is Betsy uh, uh, DeVos, and the other one you, we could talk about it, is the Gates Foundation. Um, I mean, and also just a total eradication breakdown of public education and also charter schools. We got, we got four big issues, but 
Let's talk about some of these things and how they've really thrown us a curveball. You mentioned Bill and Melinda Gates. Please uh, let us know what's going on. Uh, well, I mean, you could, folks can do their own research, but at the Gates Foundation has been behind the push for privatization and defunding and um, really surveillance of teachers um, uh, for, for at least a couple of decades. And of course, DeVos <laughs> is started, you know, got her start with charter schools in Michigan. So, you know, they're both um, major forces for the privatization of um, uh, of public education, not just K through 12, but also college level. So I think, um, uh, you know, and you mentioned, uh, Kaia, that it's, it's really a profit motive. Obviously, there's money, there's billions of, of dollars to be made off of public education and privatization of it um, in this country alone. And, and, and that's not to, to mention that this is a global trend. It's not just in, in the U.S. So um, so yeah, I, I think, um, and, and it's, it does two things. One, it's, it's profit motive because of the just enormous amount of money to be made. And two, it's also a way to gut the strongest, probably the strong, strongest labor organizing in the U.S. that's left. I mean, teachers unions are basically the strongest after they broke the, their, um, air control, uh, Reagan broke the, the, air traffic control unions and in the financial uh, crisis they broke uh, NABIT and a lot of media organizations so or unions so teachers unions are probably along with like longshoremen are probably the, the the what's left in the U.S. so it's also an attack on on uh, labor organizing and and finally it's you know it's a way to to keep the racial uh, racist, sexist hierarchy that we have in this country in place. So, um, so yeah, those are the names, you know, but the only reason I'm smiling today is because some of them got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm not a black woman with brains. You cannot <laughs> tell me that. I think it might be me today. But, yo, but, you know, Betsy uh, DeVos, um, this just happened on um, Friday. It was just just sent out a public uh, release that that the Department of Education, as it didn't give any funding to public education, just uh, announced that it's giving 131 million dollars to charter schools uh, in the U.S. So this is this you know this trend you know that we're seeing in terms of uh, and, and and FYI charter schools only. Charter schools only service 3 million students uh, in the United States. Public schools service almost 51 million students, right? So there's like a huge gap, you know, a huge gap. So uh, yeah, so there's a total gut. There, there, there's actually just this whole push to private, privatize a lot of the public services um, that we have. And I would even argue that the teachers are the strongest, there is more diversity in it. Um, longshoremen have a history of being extremely racist, um, you know, which is their, the, which is the downside. So with that being but, said- But Kaia, you have to understand too that certain school districts don't even hire their own subs. Substitutes are even outsourced. So Explain you can that. Sign, what does that look like? So, that. so you can sign up with an agency like maybe a Kelly agency, and they're nationwide. They're just, okay, we need you. Uh, you're in Kansas, boom. You're in Charlotte, boom. This is where you go to find the subs. Now, some schools, like in my, at one particular school, because there was such a, a, a consistent pattern of substitutes uh, required, they just had 20 people on deck that they were, okay, I, we, this I go to people. Come here every day. Somebody don't show up, we'll put you. So when you, you go up into the office and sign up, it'd be the same few people there. Okay, we, you go go to this building today. But other agencies, you can just sign up and they'll just send you someplace else. Uh, a couple agents, couple school districts had to sever their relationships with these agencies because they hired some people that they didn't do a third, they didn't vet properly. So in, in certain areas, especially like when I lived in, in Missouri and Kansas, they outsourced those. So at one point, maybe the school district had subs, you would get a call, but at this stage in it, 
you got to call it another agency. I didn't know I had gotten like that. So last thing on the table, what are some pending bills around education or things that we need to know as we are moving towards, you know, this, this huge voting, um, um, these huge elections that are coming up and also voting for bills and things like that locally? What are some things we need to know? Um, well, for me, I think that um, it's important to realize that even though this is something that people want to be temporary, in a lot of instances, this is actually working better for some students than others. So when, while everybody is in this push to return to schools, we need to think about all the different alternative educational settings and programs that we can have implemented in districts all over the country. Because, you know, even if it wasn't coronavirus or something else, there are children experiencing homelessness, children who, you know, have severe illnesses, parents are, have severe illnesses. Everybody can't make it to school every day, right? But that doesn't mean that everybody shouldn't have an opportunity to learn every day. And the big takeaway from this for me was what I'm doing right now in Google Classroom, even when we get back to brick and mortar, that has to continue because there are gonna be kids who can't get to me every day. There, you know, people are gonna be getting sick and then getting re-sick and, you know, we don't know what illness looks like anymore. We're used to flu season coming, you know, October and running strong through January, February, but people are gonna be getting sick all throughout the years Moving forward is how I see it. I don't see us coming up with some magical cure in the next couple of months that's gonna make everybody better, right? So there has to be systems in place where if you need a different learning modality, if you need to have your instruction online, if you need to do a hybrid program, those things need to be created in a way that they can continue to exist even past an emergency situation because Distance learning is working for some people. Hybrid learning would work better for a lot of people than being on campus every day. There are some people who need that. So I think that schools have to be honest about the needs of the, the people that they serve and create programs that allow people to do what, they, what is the best for them and their learning styles and their environment so that they have the same opportunity as everybody else so that that absence doesn't automatically equal now you're getting a citation. Now you might have to go to court. Now your parent may risk going to jail because you're not coming to school for something that could be completely legitimate. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm optimistic. Just um, like I said, I'm in a good mood because of recent news, but um, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic because mainly because of two things. One, um, teachers, like you said, teachers were the probably one of the most creative professions on the planet. <laughs> um, and so we're always coming up with solutions uh, to, to help, um, you know, our students. And uh, two, um, you know, I work a lot with Gen Z. And so I'm, I'm just excited that they're, they see through a lot of the BS and they see things very clearly. And, um, and, and they're, they're fired up to change things. Um, and, um, you know, like Mikhail said, I think, um, the, the approach that it, we really need to have to be community centered is going to things, solutions are going to look different for different communities, um, across all of their iterations. And, um, you know, we gotta, but I, I'm optimistic. I just, I always think back to, you know, April, March and April and, and being on those Zoom calls with my students and we got each other through hell. Like we, like we all logged on, no matter what was going on, we logged on just to talk to each other and check in with each other and, um, and we got each other through. And I think that we will do that again. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully out of this, um, something new movements will be born and and we can actually you know change education to to be something that that meets all of our needs um, yeah. um i i thank you i think that there's going to be I, I like all of you um even though there it's uncertain times and we don't know what's what is going to look like we're all in the 
position to reimagine. And like you, I am optimistic. I'm more optimistic now than I was, let's say three, four months ago in the thick of everything. I think what we're also going to see is what I've, well, you know what, before, let me, let me, let me ask you, let me put this out there. What have you done creatively that you've offered to your colleagues in terms of how do they teach differently? Because I'm always seeing like really great ideas on face, you know, on Facebook, you know, for me, I'm a writing professor. And so I've just totally dedicated the whole semester to students using the cities where they live as their muse so they can get out. And so all of their writing assignments are based around going to a tea house, going to a coffee shop, going to like these places that are cheap or low risk or, you know, they don't have to, you know, so that so that's one of the things that I've done and I've totally split my whole syllabi in half like I have this whole syllabi that I was going to do in the beginning and it was very clear to me we weren't going to make it so I threw out 50% of it and just said look let's just do something like that so what are some creative things that you've done well um, for me to start the year um, right before school started back I read a quote on Twitter and it was like um we have to, you know, before we can, can teach the curriculum, right, we have to make sure that the kids feel cared for, connected, make sure that they're okay. So I started the year, I think the first week or two, the only thing that we did was icebreakers, getting to know you, trying to still build those connections we would have built in class, and then teaching them how to use the technology without having them learn content right away because I didn't want them to feel like, oh, we're back in school again. And now, you know, it's just ABC one, two, three, right? I, I wanted to get to know them and allow them an opportunity to get to know me. So we did, I've, you know, I had a packet of 40 different icebreakers. We did like two or three of them every day um, just so that the kids could learn stuff about each other, talk about what had been going on while they, you know, have been at home, what have they been doing and, you know, really just trying to get them to understand like this isn't an ideal situation but we're going to make the best out of it so you know let's still try to get to know each other on a deeper level because just because we're in these tiny boxes doesn't mean that you know we don't care for each other that we're not community we're not a classroom um i put up this i'm sitting on my meeting for adult side of the room but on the other side i have my whiteboard with all my cutesy elementary border and you know, I write stuff on there. I do demonstrations at the whiteboard just to make it feel like it's still school because if all they're looking at is the whiteboard via Zoom, then, you know, it might feel like, oh, it's only looking at the computer all day. At least if I can turn to my whiteboard and stand there with my pointer finger and make it look like, you know, if we, I was still in the classroom, then they feel more like they're in class with me than just kind of looking at me and having a conversation. So to the extent that people can set up an actual classroom looking environment in their teaching space, um, I would suggest that teachers do that because I feel like it makes a big difference for them to see, you know, what they would see if they were in the classroom, just try to make it as much of the classroom as possible. Um, another thing that I did, um, actually got this from my professor from Claremont, she went back into the classroom and she created, um, her district created a, a slide that had hyperlinks to different relaxation activities that kids could do for at least five minutes. So that if somebody was feeling really overwhelmed, I can put them in a breakout room and have them go to the take five space and either do a meditation or something else in there, watch something, watch cute puppies, look at, you know, different things so that they can have a way to kind of calm down and escape and see something beautiful where you know, normally they would have been inside my classroom and gone outside and take a walk around campus to kind of get that energy out. I had to kind of put something for them to, that could be used as an escape from home and from school, even though they're stuck at home. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is what we call a natural break. <laughs> and I appreciate <laughs> <laughs> everybody for coming unless I have you know said that too fast any la last call for alcohol green tea you know latte whatever it is a, a cigar whatever it is is your you know your vice mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie I was drinking some Prosecco the whole the whole time <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> to get me through. Water. <laughs> See? Yeah. And I'm up here sipping on some sour sop. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> this is what we See? do. I know. Nah, there's an option. <laughs> I committed to be drinking something at every faculty meeting. I'd be like, mm -hmm. what you drink? Oh, this is But tea? you know what? You're not the first person that has told me that. That, you're not the first person that keeps a red cup for their Falcon meeting via Zoom. My God. <laughs> Be My God. Because they understand, you know, they're dealing with some fools right now that don't know what's up. So they're like, I need my cup ready because somebody going to say something crazy. Uh, and this exactly. is the thing, huh? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I salute you all because, of, you know, there's been massive resignations, early retirements, uh, teachers have died. Teachers, you know, are too sick to work. So thank you for being in the trenches. Just know that, you know, there's a collective. I think all of us will make ourselves available to each other if you want to talk and also share resources or be a resource like you have with uh, today. So thank y'all so much. Right. Look at you. Do right by me. Right. 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 Right.